Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to this webinar convened by the Secretary of the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy. Indeed, some of you may realize that this is an auspicious occasion to come together. Almost one year ago today, the Ocean Panel launched its action agenda for the ocean. We're excited to have you joining us for this launch of a new knowledge product commissioned by the Ocean Panel to inform their work. And this product is entitled 100% Sustainable Ocean Management an introduction to sustainable ocean plans. And if that wasn't enough, a new action coalition, which brings together leading global actors to support countries and the development and implementation of sustainable ocean plans. Today, we'll hear directly from ocean panel country representatives about their experiences in developing sustainable ocean plans in their respective contexts. From one of the lead authors behind the sustainable ocean plan guide and from members of the Ocean Action 2030 Coalition. My name is Kristen Teleki. I'm the head of the Secretariat of the High-Level Panel for Sustainable Ocean Economy and Global Director of the Ocean Program at the World Resources Institute. Before I introduce you to the Ocean Panel and our esteemed guest speakers we have with us today, we put together a one minute video to kick things off. Can we have the video now, please? The, for those of you who have not joined us before, maybe I say a few words and a brief overview about the Ocean Panel itself. The Ocean Panel aims to facilitate a better and more resilient future for people and planet. The goal of the Ocean Panel is to deliver a sustainable ocean economy where effective protection, sustainable production, and equitable prosperity go hand in hand. The Ocean Panel has been working to achieve key objectives that include enhancing humanity's relationship with the ocean, bridging ocean health and wealth, working with diverse stakeholders, harnessing the latest ocean knowledge, and developing an, an action agenda for transitioning to a sustainable ocean economy. Established in September 2018, the Ocean Panel is made up of 15 serving world leaders, co-chaired by the Prime Minister of Norway and the President of Palau. As you can see from the map, the Ocean Panel comprises members from across the world and is supported by the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for the Ocean, Peter Thompson. It is the only ocean policy body made up of serving world leaders who are triggering, amplifying, and accelerating action worldwide for ocean priorities. I'm delighted to introduce you to those who are joining us for today's event. We have Ambassador Peter Thompson, as I said, the UN Secretary General Special for the Ocean, who will give us some opening remarks via pre-recorded video. We've got Peter Hogan, who is the Program Director at the Institute of Marine Research in Norway and chair of the Ocean Panel's expert group who will deliver the keynote uh, presentation on the main findings of the guide and elaborate on the what, why, how, and who of sustainable ocean plans. This also comes to us via a pre-recorded uh, video. Uh, Peter is currently on a tall ship traveling from Nassau to Florida and it proved difficult to get his remarks live. Um, but having said that, uh, we'll move to a, a live dimension of this where we have Craig Hansen, who's the vice president of food Water, Forest, and the Ocean at the World Resource Institute, who will help launch the Ocean 2030 Coalition and moderate the panel discussion. Uh, joining Craig for this distinguished panel discussion are Martha Delgado, who is the Undersecretary for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights, and Sherpa for the President on the Ocean Panel for Mexico. Satendra Prasad, who is the Permanent Representative to the United Nations and Sherpa, 
for the Prime Minister on the Ocean Panel for Fiji. Charlotte Fontenberg, who is the global lead for the Blue Economy and Pro Blue Program Manager at the World Bank and member of the Ocean Action 23 Coalition. And Julien Barbieri, who is the head of the Marine Policy and Regional Coordination at the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO and member also of the Ocean Action 2030 Coalition. Before I start, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention a few housekeeping items. I'm sure you're all very familiar with this, but it helps us to remind of this. We obviously want to engage with you, so please post your questions throughout the event in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. Um, please also indicate who you'd like to respond. Um, very helpful to, you know, for us to direct those and the team behind the scenes here, direct the questions to the right person. Um, be sure that you do, right, is, is a question. Um, it helps to uh, stimulate a little bit of discussion. And um, if we can't get to some of those questions during this time, we'll obviously try to get to them later on um, in the session or indeed afterwards. I'm sure we'll, some of our colleagues in line will be happy to follow up. Um, the Sustainable Ocean Plan Guide itself, along with further information about Ocean Action 2030, are available on the Ocean Panel website, uh, oceanpanel.org, and the links are also there in the chat box, or will be there shortly. Um, like any of these things, we sort of welcome your amplification of these important discussions via Twitter, your social media handles, and also please follow um, uh, the uh, Ocean Panel's Twitter handle at Ocean Panel. The hashtags to use are available in the chat box as you've seen them right now, and please use those throughout the webinar. Um, just so you're aware, this webinar is being recorded and we'll send details to you early next week where you can find it. So on, on with the show, as it were. Uh, as I said to you, unfortunately, Ambassador Thompson couldn't be here in person, but he has been engaged closely with the Ocean Panel since its inception and was keen to share his perspectives on the importance of sustainable ocean plans for the sustainable growth and investment indeed into the ocean economy. We'll turn now to hear some pre-recorded remarks from Ambassador Thompson. May we have the video, please? Ladies and gentlemen, all courtesies observed and warm greetings to everyone present. It's a great pleasure to speak at this online event to launch 100% Sustainable Ocean Management, an introduction to sustainable ocean plans. Commissioned by the Ocean Panel, this guide elaborates on the what, why, how, and who of sustainable ocean plans and suggests initial steps to help countries get started on or accelerate their sustainable ocean planning. I'm advised the event will also launch a new action coalition dedicated to providing the technical and financial assistance countries may need to develop their sustainable ocean plans. I've often said now that in the wake of the 2017 UN Ocean Conference, the work of the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy has been globally exceptional in its scope and dedication to the universally agreed goal of SDG 14, to conserve and sustainably use the ocean's resources. The Ocean Panel has presented an ocean action agenda aiming to transform humanity's relationship with the ocean to one governed by the principle of sustainability. As the headline of this action agenda, the 14 heads of state and government who comprise the Ocean Panel committed to sustainably plan and manage 100% of their national marine exclusive economic zones by 2025. In addition, they urged the leaders of all coastal and ocean states to join them in this commitment so that by 2030, all ocean areas are under national jur jurisdictions that are under national jurisdictions are sustainably planned and managed. Thereby, we arrive at the central importance of this guide today. For a sustainable ocean plan is the foundation for delivering on this commitment. Ladies and gentlemen, there is one ocean and everything within it is connected. It therefore goes without saying that what happens on one shore or coast or in one marine sector will in some way affect other parts of the ocean and other users. The ocean and its resources are not limitless and our activities are increasingly filling up the ocean's available space, particularly within our exclusive economic zones. Likewise, anthropogenic impacts, whether land originated or marine based, do not disappear, but rather accumulate in the ocean. The sustainable blue economy is rightly being recognized as the future security for humankind, be it in renewable energy or genetic resources and medicines or sustainable aquaculture, the development of new forms of ocean-derived nutrition, or the greening of shipping. Widely seen as the next economic frontier, it is the driving force of the emerging age of new renewability, 
with the climate finance needle and innovative finance now moving in its direction. But we must prepare for it with care. For the rapid development of ocean-based industries means coastal areas are becoming increasingly saturated with economic activity. As the coastal and ocean space becomes ever more crowded, interactions between sectors and amongst users intensifies, meaning that an increasingly, increasingly conflicts and risks could emerge if plans, laws and governance are lacking. Few industries exist without an impact on the surrounding ecosystems and communities, so this begs the point for ocean management to be undertaken in an integrated way, one that considers both environmental concerns and all uses and users of the ocean. Ladies and gentlemen, in the past, ocean management has too often been characterized by silo, silo mentalities with short-term horizons. This must change. For building sustainable ocean resilience is a long-term, multi-sectoral and continuously evolving process. It is thus that the Ocean Panel has made its bold commitment to change the face of ocean management by taking an all-encompassing view of marine spaces so that 100% of each country's waters can be sustainably managed. The Ocean Panel's commitment will be fulfilled by developing and implementing sustainable ocean plans. This is so because by developing and implementing a sustainable ocean plan, countries will be moving away from those siloed short-term practices towards achieving sustainable ocean economies wherein protection, sustainable production, and equitable prosperity go hand in hand. Sustainable ocean plans of the type promoted by the Ocean Panel are central to safeguarding the long-term health and resilience of the ocean, attracting investment, creating jobs to the benefit of coastal communities and national economies. They're adapted to local contexts, needs, and priorities, and offer the foundation for delivering the many positive outcomes posited through the comprehensive findings of the Ocean Panel. A sustainable ocean plan creates the right enabling environment, sending a signal of a country's commitment towards science-based sustainability and the rule of law. They are the key to action in all five areas posited by the Ocean Panel. Ocean wealth, ocean health, ocean equity, ocean knowledge, and ocean finance. And finally, let me say that emerging ocean challenges and opportunities mean no country can remain complacent. And all ocean and coastal nations need to start, get started on sustainable ocean plans without delay, building on what is already there with a view to constantly improving upon plans. Ladies and gentlemen, at, as the world emerges from the COVID-19 pandemic, it is crucial for the future of our kind on this planet that we prioritize the maintenance of a healthy ocean. You've all heard the mantra, there can be no healthy planet without a healthy ocean and the ocean's health has been measurably in decline for some time now. We need not go into the details of that decline today, but in case you're not fully aware, we, and I mean all of us, have been party to driving the decline in the ocean's health. Thus, it would be disingenuous were we to launch this guide without bearing that in mind. We should ask ourselves, how are we going to stop that decline? To start with, we must govern our activities with a logical and ethical dedication to sustainability. We need to agree that the time has come to accept that linear exploitation of finite planetary resources is a dead-end street, and that we've reached a point on humanity's path whereupon global transformation to circular recycling systems of production and consumption has become a straightforward matter of survival or not. What more must we do? We must have the courage and grasp the nettle of international consensus that is so sorely required at international gatherings these days. The UNFCCC COP26 in Glasgow made solid progress, but there remains much more to achieve. And we've already begun working towards COP27 in Egypt to improve on targets to reach net zero carbon ahead of 2050. In Geneva, in two weeks' time at the WTO ministerial meeting, we must be prepared to set aside selfish national interests and agree once and for all to remove harmful fisheries subsidies, the scourge of marine ecosystems. In Nairobi in February at the UN Environmental Assembly, we must be ready to commence negotiations for an internationally binding treaty to end the plague of plastic pollution that we've unleashed upon nature. In Kunming in April at the UN Biodiversity Conference, we must adopt a target to conserve 30% of the planet's surface by 2030, 
And at the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon at the end of June next year, we must be ready to put in place the science-based solutions necessary to stop the decline in the ocean's health. Ladies and gentlemen, under universal mandate from all 193 member states of the United Nations, the next UN Ocean Conference will be co-hosted by the governments of Portugal and Kenya in Lisbon, 27 June to 1st July. I hope to see many of you there. The UN Ocean Conferences exist to keep the pressure on the implementation of SDG 14. So how are we doing on its implementation? Honest answer? Not very well. And I've pointed to, uh, to that in some order I've already said today. But lest there remains doubt in anyone's mind, I ingrain the fact that SDG 14's nemesis is humankind's continuing burning of fossil fuels. The massive scale at which we burn fossil fuels, creating the greenhouse gases blanketing our atmosphere, are commensurately changing the composition of the ocean. The ocean has absorbed 90% of the heat from global temperature rises, so it should not be a surprise that immense changes are underway and that we now witness such phenomena as escalating marine heat waves and uh, the death of coral reefs. Ladies and gentlemen, SDG 14 is a noble pursuit for us all to follow a pursuit that has at its heart the sustainable blue economy and an underlying ethos of living in harmony with Mother Nature. It's just that I mentioned that following on from the impetus generated by the Sustainable Blue Economy Conference held in Nairobi in 2018, the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon next year will keep the focus on the sustainable blue economy. On the shoulders of the conference, we're organizing a Sustainable Blue Economy Investment Forum in the adjoining city of Cascais, which will have huge business sector relevance and focus. Many believe that in the not-too-distant future, the sustainable blue economy will be the basis of human security, and as a loving grandfather, I count myself amongst them. At COP26 in Glasgow, I repeatedly stated in my speeches that we must move the climate finance needle in the direction of the sustainable blue economy, and I'm pleased to say there's now evidence that the needle is moving. Ladies and gentlemen, we have billions of people to feed and protect on this planet. We give far greater attention and resources to science, innovation, and technology to promote circularity and tackle wastage. We will establish the food security, energy requirements, and healthy conditions we seek for their futures. But following the path of science, to planning, to finance, we will get there. But not without sustainable ocean plans as our indispensable guides. Henceforth, all of our life-sustaining planning decisions will have to be made in the light of the existential imperative of our times, namely the well-being of our planetary ecosystem, for within it the survival of our species will be decided. The sustainable blue economy holds the key. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for that, uh, those words, Peter. and. Um, uh, very inspirational and good reminders of why this is so important, um, not only to those in the line, but those around the world who are thinking about how to manage their ocean. Um, now let's dig into the, the report itself. Um, delighted to hand over to Peter Hogan, as I mentioned earlier. He's one of the authors of the Sustainable Ocean Plans Guidance Document that we're launching today. Peter now will guide us through the main findings of the publication and explain what steps countries could take to get started or accelerate, indeed, their sustainable ocean planning. As I mentioned to you earlier, Peter is joining us today with pre-recorded video. So could we have the video now, please? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction. And thanks also to Peter Thompson for providing the wider context in which sustainable ocean planning can play a role in achieving a sustainable ocean economy and related events in the near future. My name is Peter Haugan and I'm a program director at the Institute of Marine Research in Norway. I also have the pleasure of serving as a chair of the expert group of the high level panel. And I have the pleasure today of introducing you to this document called 100% uh, Sustainable Ocean Management an introduction to sustainable ocean plants. So the high-level panel transformations action ag agenda contains a number of commitments, but the headline commitment is to sustainably manage 100% of the ocean area under national jurisdiction guided by sustainable plants by 2025 and within five years of joining the panel for countries coming in later. 
Also, there's an urge to all coastal and ocean states to, to do the same by 2030, so that by that time, all ocean areas under national jurisdiction are sustainably managed. And if I may add, from a personal side, of course, this should also be thought about for international areas. Sustainable ocean plans can then provide a credible basis for safeguarding the long-term health and resilience of the ocean. It can attract investment, science, planning, finance, and create jobs and make sure that coastal communities and national economies thrive. So, in order to create this document, this guide, we start from the definition of Sustainable Ocean Plan as written into the Transformations document, and I'm going to read it out. A Sustainable Ocean Plan describes policies and mechanisms to facilitate sustainable use of the ocean and maximize benefits and value creation for current and future generations. It provides a framework to reconcile conflicting uses of the ocean and its resources and enable long-term sustainable growth in the ocean economy. It can include a range of mechanisms such as regulatory reform, strategic investments in emerging sectors, marine spatial planning, integrated coastal and watershed management, and the establishment and implementation of marine protected areas and other effective area-based conservation measures that can help deliver nature's contributions to people, economic and positive biodiversity conservation outcomes, climate change mitigation and adaptation, and sustainable fisheries. So that the carefully crafted definition of a sustainable ocean plan is clearly the foundation for achieving the transformations for a sustainable ocean economy. How can it be that? It needs to guide public and private sector decision makers for management and for activities that take place in the area under national jurisdiction. It should build upon and also improve uh, current practice. It should bring all the existing ocean plans and processes together, and make sure that we have an integrated approach, fill, ga fill gaps and, uh, and, and moving forward. It should bridge all relevant sectors and stakeholders so that all the perspectives and interests are being considered, not all maybe taken um, into account fully, but considered certainly and making sure that we have a long-term perspective, provi provide for long-term health of ecosystems and making sure that thriving economies and societies into the future. So why bother? Why have going through this exercise of more planning? Why can't we just go ahead and deal with the various activities one by one? No, we can't because sustainability is about coexistence. It's about making sure that we are on the right path. And we believe that sustainable ocean plans can provide utility not only for governments, but for citizens, businesses, um, coastal communities, indigenous people and all stakeholders. It's supposed to cover, uh, you know, you can see from the word cloud here, environmental, social and economic benefits. It deals with climate, it deals with uh, job creation. It's supposed to deal uh, with all of these things, how they can play out together. And that's why we need to do it in an integrated fashion. Okay, so then we get to the heart of the matter. What is really a sustainable ocean plan? What attributes should such a plan have in order to qualify? And I should say uh, before I go on that this whole product has been the result of a fairly wide consultation process. Not only members of the expert group and contributions from the secretariat, not only the Sherpas and the teams of the high level panel countries, but also consulting with agencies that are involved in technical support and financial support to ocean sustainability. So we have a series of attributes here, which I'd like to dwell on a little bit, because we believe that these are key and, and characteristics that should be around for every sustainable ocean plan, depend, regardless of what is the condition in the individual countries, what is the state of play, what is the level of activity, what are the sectors in there. And three of these attributes goes to on process. I already mentioned it should be inclusive and integrative. It should look at all relevant aspects. It should also be iterative, and that's quite important. It's not like we make one plan by 2025 and then we sit back and then it's done. This has to change. Actors change, industries change, conditions change. So there needs to be a system of updating these plans in order to make them fit for future to serve the country in the long term. 
then what are characteristics of the content? Place-based, that, that goes without saying, it could be one plan for the entire exclusive eco economic zone or it could be divided, but it needs to be defined what area uh, it covers. Ecosystem-based, we need to make sure that the ecosystem functions uh, continue to function and that they are uh, well served by the plan. It needs to be knowledge-based and we need to continuously update the knowledge to serve these plans also in the revision. It needs to have impact and in order to make sure that it has impact it needs to have endorsement from the highest level of government and that's really a key feature of the high level panel. It is high level so endorsement makes sure that the plan that is produced is having the government support that it needs. It needs to be financed in terms of the actual work of doing the plan but also in terms of executing it and capacitated we need to have the capacity in place to uh, actually work with the plan. So uh, those were the nine attributes that really need to be there in order to qualify for a sustainable ocean plan. In addition, there may be some components that could be useful in the production of a sustainable ocean plan. We naturally think of area-based plans like marine spatial planning, which are not the same as sustainable ocean plans, definitely not, but a useful components potentially either whether they are in existence when starting or they should be developed as part of the sustainable ocean planning. It needs to be in, uh, looked at whether environmental protection approaches uh, are already uh, you know, uh, formulated and available uh, as documents to take in, be taken into consideration or should be developed. Economic development strategies, sector by sector or all together, and of course, social and cultural considerations that may inform the use of the marine area. Enabling policies to do this, enabling finance to do this, and not least to look at ocean accounts, uh, which is an area that also is highlighted very much by the high-level panel as quite useful for a sustainable ocean economy, an area which should be developed and which may be helpful uh, also for sustainable ocean planning is to highlight ocean accounts. So I mentioned that sustainable ocean planning is an iterative process. Uh, we need to engage stakeholders as they appear over time and we need to prepare and gather knowledge uh, more or less continuously as it evolves. Um, but then to start with a sustainable ocean plan setting the scope, agreeing on what needs to be included, preparing a draft, develop the plan, implement the plan, monitor and evaluate and update in an iterative fashion is, is needed. And in order to guide this process, uh, we have a checklist of plan development included in the report. And then you need to apply, of course, indicators of implementation in order to make sure that the plan is not only a plan, but is actually used to achieve what you want to achieve. So finally, and this is my last slide in this presentation, here are four uh, no regret initial steps for getting started. If we start in the upper left corner to organize, uh, to raise awareness uh, among relevant ministries and sectors, and then determine which is the appropriate authority to drive the planning process because this is going to be an integrative process and we need to have somebody to take the charge and drive the process. And then to consult in order to prioritize uh, what are the country priorities, uh, where do we want to go, uh, what are the key considerations to include, to have a vision and, and, a, and a way forward for a goal for this plan. And then to take stock of what's already there. Uh, what are the components, uh, some of the useful components I've mentioned? Uh, what are the uh, existing uh, components that could be used and which are already in place? And maybe they just basically need to be integrated and need to be looked at and prioritized and harmonized in a way. And then finally, to uh, align support, make sure that the technical assistance and financial resources are available and in order to pursue sustainable ocean planning. I believe that uh, with this uh, document today and with the meeting today, uh, where you will hear more about sustainable ocean planning from a country perspective and from other perspectives, 
we have started on a journey that will eventually take uh, the countries towards sustainable ocean economy using uh, and sharing experiences from sustainable ocean planning uh, between them and making sure that we get the right players on board um, to deliver uh, what the high level panel is all about a sustainable ocean economy uh, for all uh, for all players thank you thank you so much for those words peter and hopefully some some initial insights into the guide on sustainable ocean planning um, no doubt you'll have some questions please do put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'd now like to give the floor to Craig Hansen, who will launch the Ocean Action 2030 Coalition and tell us more about the coalition members and how they will support countries in their aim of building a sustainable ocean economy through the development and implementation of sustainable ocean plans. Craig, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christian, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all. Uh, it's my uh, distinct pleasure to uh, announce the formation of a new Action Coalition. Uh, you've heard now about sustainable ocean plans and the guide to developing sustainable ocean plans is being launched today, uh, commissioned by the High Level Panel for a Stable Ocean Economy. Well, in response to the headline commitment of the Ocean Panel, which actually calls for countries to develop sustainable ocean plans, uh, a number of entities have come together to form what we call an action coalition to help those countries actually develop the Sustainable Ocean Plans. This, this coalition is called Ocean Action 2030. It's designed to support countries with their Sustainable Ocean Plans. It's a voluntary coalition dedicated to supporting coastal and ocean states to develop and implement sustainable ocean plans by providing the technical and or financial assistance that those countries need. Where there is a match between the country demand and the Ocean Action 20. 30 member capacity. You can see on the screen uh, the list of the founding members. Previous slide, please. List of the founding members of the Ocean Action uh, 2030. They include, I know the logos are kind of small, so I'll, I'll read them out to you. All, all 16 members here, Asian Development Bank, Blue Prosperity Coalition, Environmental Defense Fund, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the Global Environment Facility, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, Ocean Conservancy, the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Nature Conservancy, the United Nations Development Program, the United Nations Environment Program, the World Bank, WRI, and Worldwide Fund for Nature. Quite a collection of entities that can provide both the financial and or the technical assistance countries need to develop sustainable ocean plans. Now, Ocean Action 2030 members can engage countries with their development of same ocean plans in a number of ways, and I'll highlight four here. First, collectively, we can help raise ambition. Right? We can persuasively communicate the economic, social, and environmental benefits of sustainable ocean plans to help make the case to governments as well as other stakeholders within a nation as well as globally. Secondly, several of the members, there's quite a few of the members of Ocean Action 2030 can provide technical assistance. This is the technical assistance to provide guidance to governments on sustainable ocean plan development. They can offer the hands-on technical assistance, both in terms of content and the process for developing sustainable ocean plans, as well as help build domestic local capacity to develop as well as implement sustainable ocean plans. So that technical assistance is an important uh, offer that the Ocean Action 2030 will be providing. At the same time, some members of Ocean Action 2030 will be able to offer financial assistance to countries that needed that financial assistance as well. And this is the financing needed to help support plan development from start all the way into the process of implementation. And finally, collectively, we all share best practices in plan development, implementation, and continuous improvement. Drawing in lessons learned and insights from other countries as well as uh, experts and practitioners to bring those insights to uh, any particular national government that wants that assistance and wants to know what does best practice look like. So Ocean Action 2030 has come together to provide this technical and financial assistance to countries that are embarking and or accelerating their journey down developing stable ocean plans as outlined 
in the guidance that's just been launched today. So I want to uh, basically let the world know that Ocean Action 2030 is available, it exists, we are here to help you as a nation, as you embark or continue on your journey towards stable ocean planning, we are here to help you provide that technical and or financial assistance. So I'm very pleased with that uh, announcement for today. It's a big deal. Not only are we launching the guidance on how to do the who, what, when, why, and how of a stable ocean plans, but now there is a, co a, co a cohort of, of international entities that are available to provide that assistance. So I'll stop there and uh, round, virtual round of applause for the launch of this Ocean Action 2030. And to give us some insights now into ocean, sustainable ocean plans, uh, as well as Ocean Action 2030, it's my pleasure to invite onto the virtual stage uh, four panelists, distinguished individuals in their respective rights. Bring on stage here Martha Delgado, who is the Undersecretary for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights and the Ocean Panel Sherpa for the President of Mexico. Martha, welcome. I also invite onto the sta virtual stage Satyendra Prasad, who's the permanent representative to the United Nations and the Ocean Panel Sherpa for the President of Fiji. Welcome, Satyendra. Also I invite to the virtual stage here, Charlotte de Fontambert, who's the global lead for the blue economy and pro blue program manager at the World Bank. And the World Bank is one of the members of Ocean Action 2030. And finally, Julian Barriere, who's the head of marine policy and regional coordination at the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO. And the IOC as well is a member of Ocean Action 2030. Welcome the four of you. I see you all there on my screen. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and thank you for all the great work you've been doing on the ocean uh, up to this moment and going forward. So I really want to express appreciation for that. Satyendra, I think we'll start with you. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about the significance of the Ocean Panel's commitment, uh, quote, to get 100% of ocean area under national jurisdiction under sustainable management. You know, Fiji is a member of the Ocean Panel. It's part of the headline commitment from last year. Love to get your thoughts on the significance of that. Thank you very much, uh, Craig. And thank you very much uh, for this excellent uh, overview and introduction of the sustainable 100% uh, sustainable approach and also to uh, Peter and Peter uh, for framing uh, uh, the discussions. Uh, what, uh, what you have just launched is, uh, is a quantum leap forward uh, in development of countries and development of uh, ocean states. Uh, it's, it's quantum leap uh, because of what uh, uh, countries like ours have recognized over the years and what we have learned over the years that uh, the sustainable development of the blue economy and as a consequence of the whole of the economy will not succeed if you are uh, uh, developing uh, through silos and through parts of the ocean economy. And what do I mean by that? If you're looking only at fishing and fisheries management and, and harvesting of, of fish, uh, for example, not linking it to how uh, to shipping, not linking it to how skills are generated in the economy, not linking it to uh, the short and medium term skills that are necessary for, for sustainable uh, fish, uh, uh, fisheries uh, industry. And as a consequence of uh, not taking an integrated approach, what is the price that uh, some countries are paying? The price some countries are paying is uh, their own policies might have led to, for example, overfishing their own policies may have led to concentration of fisheries into the uh, harvesting and export uh, uh, rather than on processing and value addition and, uh, and uh, integrating society. So the approach uh, uh, that the high level uh, panel has taken is uh, to help societies uh, take and countries take a wholesome, integrated approach to oceans management, oceans conservation and the development of their uh, national economies. You have out outlined the, the parts and components. I will not go through it, uh, but I just want to restate that this is a quantum leap forward. And uh, thank you very much for us assembling uh, the uh, World Bank, Pro Blue, uh, and, and so many of the ocean expertise uh, around the table uh, that are now available uh, to countries like Fiji and to other island countries uh, who would be very excited in getting integrated support uh, 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 within the framework of the 100% uh, approach uh, to, to help them think through 
how to develop uh, a, a 100% uh, approach uh, to oceans management in their own countries. So thank you very much for, for a wonderful initiative and congratulations for launching uh, such a fantastic uh, uh, product uh, for all of us. Thank you, Satyendra. You, I know Fiji has been an active proponent of looking at all of your ocean area, like the, the so-called 100% approach for ocean management. You've been quite active and, and vocal about that on the global stage. Why is that approach so uh, important to, to the nation of Fiji? So uh, now I'm uh, looking domestically uh, within Fiji. So, uh, one thing Fiji has done is, uh, I was saying in general terms, but in uh, more precise ways, we have uh, taken uh, several years, something like three years to develop a national oceans policy for the first time. And uh, so for the first time, you have a piece of uh, a, a policy uh, that has involved broad society-wide and uh, stakeholder-wide uh, consultations come through the uh, various government systems endorsed by the government. And uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's important. What, uh, at the government level, what it's allowed us to do is to, is to link the many different parts of government that deals with ocean, their fisheries part, their environment part, their shipping part. There's so many different uh, these, uh, skills and human resource development part. They are brought together in this policy, but then we realize that even that a national oceans policy doesn't go far enough. Uh, that you need to lock it into law, and uh, Fiji uh, only this year, a couple of months back, uh, has uh, passed its Climate Act, and uh, the oceans policy is now very much part uh, reflected and locked into the uh, uh, to uh, uh, to the Climate Act. So the oceans and climate nexus uh, nexus uh, flows from that. As, uh, as a consequence of this 100%, uh, so uh, this brings the whole of uh, the 100% approach uh, uh, in, into play. And let me uh, uh, give you some examples, two or three examples I'll pick up. Oceans management doesn't mean the activities are only on oceans. You have to think about uh, farming practices, fertilizers, pesticides, and this, uh, these type of things that are used on land and their impact. So lots of things uh, and lots and lots of these activities are land-based. Second, second part. Uh, do we understand the impact of shipping and uh, highly sensitive, uh, biodiversity sensitive uh, coral reefs? Uh, we did not understand. With a 100% uh, approach, you understand how ships move. Uh, ships move by economy, by, of course, where they can move. And second, what are the most economical routes? This may not be the most uh, bi uh, bi biodiversity uh, friendly ways in which ships should move. So when you have a 100% approach, you can begin to map uh, commercial shipping and how ships sh uh, should be moved to minimize their impact and damage. And finally, uh, my final part would be why this is so important. We had taken an approach of having many marine protected areas. Uh, so there'd be a marine protected area in the south and five or six marine protected areas in west, etc. parts of Fiji. In the end, you realize that system cannot work. You, you have a 100% approach and you will have a network of marine protected areas with different levels of protection. Some of them highly, highly protected. Some of them allowing for some, uh, some fish, uh, fisheries and some commercial activity and some of them you know, in, in the mix and match. So it has allowed us to integrate many marine protected areas locally. Some of them are community owned, some of them uh, by government into an integrated way. So they make uh, uh, ecological, environmental and sustainability uh, type of sense for the whole of the economy. And in the end, uh, this, uh, this is good for, uh, for governments. Uh, this is uh, good for business and industry, but most importantly, uh, this is good for people and communities because they know what is their stake in it. The stake has been made clear to them and they know therefore uh, how to protect those uh, stakes in a, in, a, in a manner that makes sense uh, uh, to them at very, very local levels. Thank you. Thank you very much, Satyendra. Uh, Martha, uh, Mexico has been moving forward at pace to translate the ocean panel's headline commitment into action uh, over the past year. So what's your country's experience with getting started on developing a stable ocean plan. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It is an honor for uh, me to address uh, this audience today. And uh, Mexico, we believe that we are starting a new phase of this uh, ocean panel that will mark a turning point for our ocean. So we are very excited about this idea and we have been working very hard. So thank you for the invitation. First of all, I want to congratulate the addition of the United States to the ocean panel. These uh, regionally speaking represent a great opportunity for North America. 
because Canada, US, and Mexico, we can coordinate activities direct towards the definition and implementation for a robust, sustainable ocean plans uh, and uh, in a coordinated way. So it's also a, a new exercise for us. And uh, uh, in our domestic context, uh, the sustainable ocean plan must build the existing policy instruments in the, the country around strategic planning, governance, marine spatial planning, uh, monitoring and finance, and a lot of activities that are involved with the sustainable uh, management of, uh, of the uh, ocean. So our approach has been looking into these elements, our pillars, uh, in an articulated and uh, interrelated way. I have to say that we have been working in uh, the uh, institutional architecture to place uh, the transformation documents and also the, our ocean plans. For example, Mexico uh, Intersecretarial Commission for the Sustainable Management of Seas and Coast is a pillar for governance, and it has recently approved the update of the national policy of seas and coast. This policy will be uh, the cornerstone for the development of our sustainable ocean plan, uh, our strategic uh, planning pillar. Uh, this document will be very soon published in our federal official gas set. And I want to highlight the extraordinary work for the Ministry of Navy, who chairs the Intersecretarial Commission. It, uh, it means that all the uh, federal government is involved in the planning and uh, creating this new institution and framework. So another existing instrument that will be fundamental uh, for our ocean plan is the ecological marine ordinances. Uh, they are uh, planning tools of an environmental policy with the purpose of inducing the use of natural resources of the marine environment and uh, productive uh, uh, activities on the a framework of sustainability, which integrate the protection of mine and coastal areas. So we are grateful for being working with the Ministry uh, of the Environment and Natural Resources, which oversees this marine special planning pillar. Additionally, we are designing a social ecological ocean knowledge platform that will facilitate uh, access to marine data and information. And this platform will also contribute uh, to the national ocean accountability, increasing our existing knowledge uh, in social, in economic and environmental aspects that are related to our national waters. We are ensuring our uh, sustainable ocean plan follows the main principles stated uh, in the SOPA uh, guide. So through wide participation and consultations with a variety of uh, stakeholders in Mexico, including indigenous communities and local communities uh, will be anchored as well in existing structures and regulatory legal framework. So we aim to have uh, the, our first program version in, in 2023. 23. And uh, this version, of course, will uh, present uh, different areas of opportunity for us, lessons learned, the improvement, uh, and will be also subject of a process of adaptation throughout the time. That sounds fantastic. Congratulations, Martha, to you and your colleagues for all the great elements. You taught many of the items you talked about were, 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 were components and key features and characteristics that Peter Haugen described in his, in his launch of, of, of the guide. I'm curious, you, know, you've you, you mentioned a number of steps that you've taken. Um, if you don't mind highlighting a few elements you think are particularly important and why, uh, whether it's engaging, engaging indigenous peoples, uh, engaging the Navy. I was interested to hear that the, the Navy is actually engaged with this, et cetera. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the importance of some of these steps. Yes, the Navy is engaged because they are coordinating all the uh, Inter, uh, inter departmental uh, committee. So uh, I, I want to highlight the, the work of uh, the South Sherpa, Andrew Rhodes is working with me and he, he has uh, advised us and uh, led all these steps that we have made uh, in order for us to identify several policy instruments in the country to be aligned in the ocean panel transformation. And uh, we are conducting a national conduct consultation pro process to identify Mexico's priorities from the transformational document also. And um, 
We have an expert group and members which are uh, uh, helping us to organize these ocean, ocean plants. And uh, we uh, have uh, formulated the instrumentation uh, a strategy for a sustainable ocean economy in Mexico 21 to 24, which is about to be published in this gazette that I mentioned. A key element has been the uh, close work with Mexico, with this intersecretarial commission that I also uh, mentioned before. And I have to say that another fundamental step has been working with the World Bank office in Mexico. Uh, through the Pro Blue initiative that I think that uh, was mentioned before, we want to thank this organization and uh, Charlotte de Fontebeau here, here present for the pre-approved funds for Mexico, which will be very, very useful during the crucial first process of designing and defining our ocean plan. Great, thank you, Martha. And just for the audience, we did not pre-plan that uh, endorsement. <laughs> it just so happens we have two of the key members here on, on the screen, but that's the great thing about these panels, isn't it? Uh, we're all working together here towards that cause. So love it and thank you very much, Martha, for calling out appears. This is the Ocean Action 2030 in action. This is what we're talking about, the, the technical and or financial assistance available to countries that have the will and vision to take the next steps. That's what this is all about. So. Thank you very much, Martha. Charlotte, I'll come to you in a second, but first, I'll actually come to you now, actually, Charlotte. Uh, it's a, no, Julian comes first, I believe. I'm gonna go to Julian here, jump around here. Julian, um, how does a sustainable ocean plan build upon, yet go beyond marine spatial planning? We heard Peter talk about MSPs being part of a component of, but I'd love to hear your, your take on how a sustainable ocean plan builds on, yet goes beyond. Thank you, Craig, and, and uh, hello, dear colleagues. Uh, so, yeah, great question. Where, 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 where is the gap, and where, what is the, the synergy? So, I think at first glance, when we look at uh, you know the, the conceptual perspective of, of both marine spatial plans and sustainable ocean planning, there are some some common attributes. I mean, this issue of integration, the issue of being iterative, participative, inclusive, ecosystem based, knowledge based. Uh, I think apply to to, to both. In practice, MSP is, is um, you know can assume the very different forms. It can be a high-level plan uh, to a more comprehensive and detailed spatial plan, and it can have address different geographical scales within the countries. It can address the whole of the EZ, or it can address one uh, region of uh, of the EZ. And MSP is really an area-based plan that really focuses on the special analysis and really aims to reduce conflicts. Uh, and to find synergies amongst users. But I see the, the sustainable ocean planning process at a different uh, level than the special plan. It's really about developing a, a kind of unifying framework for integrated ocean governance. As Peter said, uh, it's really about guiding public and private sector decision makers on how to sustainably manage a nation's entire ocean area and resources under natural jurisdiction. With, of course, this, this, this ambition of economic, social, and environmental goals. But I think it's also a great opportunity to embed sustainability in all ocean sectors uh, that are operating in, that, in those space, whether it's the fisheries, the shipping, the tourism uh, operators, or the mineral extractions. So I think the, the, the guidance that the Sustainable Ocean Plan is providing, you know, will probably start with some kind of policy at a higher level, which kind of set up the vision. Uh, for the country on, on, on the ocean space and resources, then it, has, it needs to be complemented by regulatory frameworks, by strategic investments in emerging sectors, economic incentives, for example, for, for low carbon activities. It needs to also address the interface with, uh, with the land, uh, the coastal and watershed management aspects, uh, as well as the management of, of fisheries and establishment of uh, you know, conservation measures like MPAs. So I think for to deliver the sustainable ocean plan, integration is really a, a key element. It's an integration that needs to um, take place both at the vertical level, you know, when we need to look at the different scales of governance, because not, not every country is set up the same way. You know, we have different administrative and, and governance structures. Some countries are more working around federal organizations, some of us are much more centralized. So that's that needs also to be addressed. But the issue of uh, coordination, uh, you know, from national to lo local level is very important. So the MSP approach, I think, still offers a very important building block for sustainable ocean planning. First, there's a great, you know, there's a huge community out there that's been working on MSP and, and, and 
that community can really be uh, mobilized to, 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 to kind of build this broader framework of a sustainable ocean planning. And we'd, we've been trying to do that in the context of our work at IOC, and, and this was reflected very recently in the MSP Global International Guide that we published last October. I think we also need to recognize that, uh, you know, sometimes MSP is uh, triggered by different needs uh, and, you know, very often we've seen in countries it's triggered by the needs to find more space for emerging industries, for example, renewable uh, offshore energies. And, and, and whereas I think the sustainable ocean planning is really more about setting a strategic vision of the ocean space uh, and, and the management of those resources. We also need to recognize that there's not one fit for all. It needs to be really driven by, uh, by stakeholders. And that vision needs to be elaborated by, by stakeholders. So I think what would be very important as we move forward with, uh, with our coalition is really to, to really understand you know, how countries have embarked in, in, in SOPs in, because you know, from what we already hear from Fiji and Mexico, there are some elements there that, that we can build on and really see where are the gaps uh, that needs to be filled uh, and, and where you know, the assistance needs to come in. And I think that's, that's really what it is about, this coalition. Great, thank you, th th thank you, Julian. Um, you know, marine spatial planning, you know, is an essential component of sustainable ocean plans. However, back in 2017, only about what 10% or so of the world's exclusive economic zones were covered by a government-approved marine spatial plan. If I, if my numbers are correct, so how is the world progressing on marine spatial planning, and what will it take to have this foundation operational for all countries? Yeah, that's correct, uh, Craig. Uh, in about 2017, when we, we organized our, our big international conference on MSP, we, we, we calculated that it was between 10 and 15 percent of countries, um, of, sorry, of EZ, of national EZ that were under some, some MSP process. Um, but since then, I think there's been a, a strong move to, 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 to implement MSP. Uh, I mean, we have a in Europe, of course, this has become a, a, a mandatory uh, legal obligation uh, you know, through the MSP directive that was uh, endorsed by European countries. So that already puts a, a whole block moving forward. Uh, and and you know, they are supposed to implement this by, by, by the end of this year. Uh, but we're also seeing uh, you know, many countries also in the global south that are uh, embarking in MSP. So we, we estimate that over about 45 countries worldwide have uh, either implementing or approving marine spatial plans and uh, probably a dozen more that are laying the foundations uh, to, to, to develop those, the, those plans. Uh, and I, th I think, you know, we've heard if we look at the, at the members of a high level uh, panel, you know, we had Ambassador Prasad and mentioned the, 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 the work that Fiji with the National Ocean Policy, so which is a very kind of a framing important element in the development of sustainable ocean plans. Uh, I think we've also been uh, interacting with Mexico uh, about uh, you know, how to, to also support the, the process. We, we know that there are a number of marine ecological plans uh, for the bioregions that have been put in place. Uh, so there may be the, 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 the discussion is really how we create the framework, the overarching framework that is going to guide and drive and align these different uh, marine uh, management initiatives. We also have experience in Canada, for example, where we have uh, you know, the inclusion of, uh, of um, indigenous and local communities in those processes. And I think this is very important that we also consider this from a local perspective, uh, because you know, this is only going to work if stakeholders are, are at the table and also have a, a way to, to, to support that. So overall, I think most HLP members have embarked somehow in, uh, in, in some level of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, sustainable ocean planning. What we, we need to have is really have a, a, a better tools to measure where countries are. So we can really guide the work of our coalition in terms of focus and assistance. And we can also learn from each other. I think it's very important that we build also a, a framework for, for sharing uh, uh, information, best practices on what's worked and uh, what's not working. It's, it's for the benefit of, of, of the whole uh, community. Great, thank you, Julian. And thank you for all the insights and all the work that IOC does on, on this issue. Uh, Charlotte, uh, Peter Thompson spoke in the opening about sound sustainable ocean planning as a basis for unlocking investment into the ocean economy. So what role do you think sustainable ocean plans play in this regard? 
Thank you, Craig. Um, can I just start by, by a big um, shout out to Marfa and uh, Sachendra? It's such a pleasure to meet both of you. And um, I was not going to talk about the World Bank's support to these countries. We always let the, uh, the recipient countries mention it first. So we'll get back to that. Um, Craig, um, what I really liked about, about Peter Thompson's uh, presentation this morning is it's, it's very, um, it's very uh, systemic and uh, not at all dogmatic. And I think this is what the, uh, the value of the sustainable ocean plans is about. The World Bank's twin goals are reducing extreme poverty and enhancing shared prosperity. So we are coming to this with a vision of the economic development of the coastal and marine countries. But as, as Peter Thompson has said uh, repeatedly, it's also about ocean health. So for us, from a blue economy perspective, it is how do we maximize the potential for development? We all know the um, OECD figures about the size of the ocean economy, but how can we ensure that this development is not going to be at the cost of ocean health? So what we see is, is the need for a complete break from business as usual. And I think this is where the sustainable ocean plans come in um, with the recognition as, um, as the other Peter said this morning, that it cannot be prescriptive, but it has to be inspirational. So what we are saying is obviously we've identified now an area around which we all understand we can work together, we can collaborate. The World Bank has an important role to play and everything from our perspective is going to be driven by country from the um, demand from the country, which again is why I'm so happy to see Marta and Sachendra on this call. Great, thank you, Charlotte. And, and, and I do want to uh, congratulate the World Bank and thank the World Bank for all the great stuff that you do on the ocean. Pro Blue being a fantastic uh, program that countries uh, that have the will, right, can tap into uh, to help them on this journey. So thank you uh, for that. Um, now, whether it's the ocean panel countries, other countries, the ambitions that we've been talking about today are pretty high. Um, it's going to take financial resources for some of these countries to actually embark and, and implement on this process. So what type of financing exists for countries uh, if, if they seek support for stable ocean plan development? Okay. Well, I think I think there's two ways to answer this question. The question, the first question is how, and the second question is how much. So, in terms of how, it, it goes back to this idea of breaking from business as usual. The World Bank altogether right now has a global ocean portfolio of about nine billion dollars. Um, that's with a B. Um, but what we're trying to do is to apply this blue economy lens to our operations so that we enhance sustainability and integration. Uh, we've heard quite a bit about integration. What Julien said about the uh, MSB that's basically at the root of this integration. We've heard this morning about the conf conflicts of, uh, amongst users. So these are really crucial points. In terms of hard figures, so we talked a little bit about ProBlue. ProBlue is a multi-donor trust fund that was created with 14 development partners, um, we, which to which have been contributed about just short of um, 200 million US dollars. And we have identified, some members of the HLP have identified ProBlue as a vehicle through which the bank can help support HLP members and non-HLP members embark on a journey to implementing the recommendations of the HLP. So that is where we are right now. In addition to um, Fiji and Mexico, we have a number a number of dialogues with other countries, as I said, HLP members and non-members. And, and we're trying to at least engage in a demonstration project value, if you will. We are trying to see and to show that by working with our client countries, we can help them support um, in, um, in, in, in implementing these recommendations. I will say, however, that we understand that what we have is a drop in the bucket um, and that more needs to be done, particularly in terms of um, helping countries build the enabling environment that's going to attract uh, private sector investment. Right, so it's not a case where the World Bank thinks that we have the we're the end all and we have the solution to the blue economy. What we're trying to to do is really identify 
lessons that can be learned, demonstration projects. And this is where the Ocean Action Coalition is so important. It's recognizing that we have different roles to play. And we're looking at our participation in the coalition as a vehicle. Great, a very good point, right? It, no one entity can provide all the technical and or financial assistance to all the countries that embark on this journey during this decade, right? It's yeah, So it's great that as you articulate, pioneering some approaches, testing it, kind of probing the way, but we have to crowd in even more finance, uh, public and private finance, right? As well as crowd in even more uh, technical assistance, as well as build that local capacity right, in country for this. So uh, very, very good points that I just want to emphasize uh, to our audience. Uh, we've got a few more minutes for, for, this, for this panel session. I'm going to go back to each of the panelists for one more question. Um, we'll try to finish this in 10 minutes so we can get to the audience Q&A. So if you can keep your answers to two and a half minutes each, if my math is correct. Uh, Julian, I jump to you here. Uh, what are the major barriers, whether it be technical, capacity, financial, you name it, what are the major barriers that may stand in the way of greater adoption of nations by of, of sustainable ocean plans? Uh, thanks, Greg. So, so I'm sure many of you have heard Peter Thompson and actually Peter Hagen also say this uh, this usual mantra, which is science, planning, financing. And I think we need to start with the science because the science needs really to to, to support and, and, and guide uh, the development of these tools. Uh, and we're not just talking about ocean science, we're talking about science in a wider sense from, you know, social science, economic analysis, law governance, and, and you know, bringing in also indigenous knowledge systems into, into the process. Uh, at, the, at the, you know, ocean scale, we, we need better observation to understand the multiple stressors that are impacting marine ecosystems. Um, we need, you know, tools to, uh, to understand the value of marine ecosystem goods and, and services. Uh, because this data is going to be critical in making uh, specific you know, political choices on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the plans themselves. We need to understand the, 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 the risks uh, aspects, how we factor in climate change. You know, we're talking about long-term uh, processes here. Um, and, and therefore, you know, we need to have much better data and, and integration of data uh, through the adequate uh, technical infrastructure and data infrastructure. So I think there are a number of technical barriers that you know, we can try to work on together. Uh, I mentioned the data aspects, I mentioned the, the specific tools that we need to, uh, you know, to, to zone and understand special conflicts in the, in the marine space. We also need specific tools for engaging stakeholders. Uh, you know, we've been experimenting in our in our work in Latin America and in Mediterranean the the use of story storytelling tools, and that really helps. You know, stakeholders, whether you are a fisherman, whether you you are a conservation conservationist, to come up with uh, you know the vision for the ocean space and, and really engage in, in in getting your your points across the board. So all of this needs to be supported by capacity development. Uh, you know, we need dedicated human resources uh, for, for, for marine planning, for ocean governance. I think it's important that these both human and institutional capacities need to be self-driven. It's not something that can be driven by just you know, pumping a massive amount of, uh, of money and, and, and foreign experts into a country. This really, uh, I think, and this is important to, to really ensure that uh, there are investments uh, that are required and the countries understand what, what those investments are in the long term because a, a sustainable ocean plan is not just a quick fix. It's a, it's a process that will require update, that will require monitoring, adaptation, and for that you, we need to have a, the, the right resources. I will not mention financial resources because I think that's more in Charlotte's corner. But certainly, I, I, I think um, the, the, the partners that are you know, brought today around this, uh, this coalition have the capacity to address all, all three issues, you know, the, 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 the political leadership with the guidance of the members of a high level panel, the assistance, the technical assistance, the financing, the cap capacity development. I also need to uh, say that from the science side, uh, we're very much interested in the context of a UN decade of ocean science to really deliver specific tools and solutions for ocean management. And this is something that we will be working in the coming months uh, to, 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 to deliver this uh, you know, new, new generation of uh, information, data, and skills that are required for, for management. Great, thank you. Thank you, Julian. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned Mexico here. I mean, Martha, uh, your presentation uh, was fantastic and it sounds like things are going, going great. You're building the best of capacity. You have financial uh, assistance to hear with you. 
but there must be some challenges. They can't all be rosy, right? I, I think the audience would love to hear, you know, what are a couple of the challenges you faced and how did you overcome them? Just kind of make it, make it real because it's going to be bumpy for some folks. I'd love to hear any thoughts in two minutes you might share. Yes, Craig, indeed. Uh, it is very challenging uh, to really reach a common understanding and work together with very different institutions in Mexico to achieve the same goal. Sometimes it's uh, easier to uh, have agreements with the uh, states members of, of the UN rather than our own institutions, in, at least in Mexico. So yet uh, we have been uh, overcoming this challenge by creating this inter-ministerial group and also working uh, with um, very clear and uh, very open uh, uh, way uh, to, in order to include all the perspectives needed. And it is interesting because uh, the main objective of the of the panel is is uh, really getting uh, the environmental and conservation uh, targets of the of the sustainability management of the ocean really also aligned with the economical side and taking also into account the the fisher persons uh, live, uh, life quality and also the indigenous communities perspective so that was very challenging and uh, another challenge was uh, also uh, have a work uh, on diagnosis for the identification of the national information and, inter and international initiatives. So also identify the different efforts that the country is uh, uh, undertaking on, on this agenda was uh, also challenging for us. And the last uh, also was uh, to contribute to uh, um, the uh, uh, data gathering in Mexico, we are lack of really uh, very so uh, to contribute to this uh, oceanic accountability and to monitor the ocean plants and provide information on critical areas, for example, for the decision making as production, the real income and uh, its distribution, or the well being of the communities around the, the, the ocean management. We are working very close with different institutions as the Institute of Ecology and Climate Change, the Ministry of Navy, the Environment Ministry, the National uh, Institute of Statistics and Geography in order for them to organize the database. And uh, I, know, I think that we are, will uh, be successful on gathering this information that will be key and useful tool for the development of our ocean plants. Great, thank you, Martha. And thank you for sharing your national experiences here with, with us and with everyone here in this audience. Charlotte, uh, you mentioned about being, you know, the, the drop in the ocean in terms of finance, right? So from your perspective, what's gonna what's it gonna take to scale up the financing that's needed to shift the ocean economy onto a sustainable path? Thanks, Craig. That is the hardest question. So thank you for that. Um, it is, I think it's gonna it's gonna require us to think outside the box. And I think it it requires us to be creative thinking. Um, I, I'm just going to mention a, a couple of, of, of things that we're working on. Um, so obviously, always with a view to building an enabling environment and public partnership um, approaches. So that's that's always the case. But I want to talk a little bit about, so everybody knows about the Seychelles Blue Bond, which um, the bank was involved with and was a, a resounding success, but also took a lot of work and resources. And, and we are exploring this approach in other countries. I just want to, everybody to be a little bit realistic about the amount of work and how specific the conditions need to be for this to succeed. So everybody should look at that as a possibility, and I know some of the HLP members are looking at it, but we need to look a little bit beyond. A couple of things I want to mention. One of them is a um, the COAST program, which we launched in the Caribbean, which is a parametric insurance program, the first um, uh, event of that kind around fisheries in the Caribbean, where the fishermen get a payoff when there is an extreme event. But as a quid pro quo, there's also a commitment to um, registering and uh, abiding by fisheries measures. So this is a, a, a case. It's it's been it's been uh, launched in a number of countries. It's expanding. We get a very positive response from um, the country that are involved. And it again goes to the demonstration value, right? It had never been done. Something similar was attempted in the Pacific a bit differently. We tried in the Caribbean. We invested obviously tremendous resources. It's working. 
And then the word is spreading. And now the other islands of the Caribbean are coming to us and say, hey, we want to do what those guys did. So obviously that, that is very important. And in terms, another example I want to give in terms of the pu public partnership um, approach is we've also been looking at the economic value of marine protected areas and w in a very hard nosed way and extracting some concrete numbers in terms of jobs, in terms of dollar production, in terms of engine for economic development, which now we're trying to translate into tourism operations. So all this to say, Again, these are okay. These are now a series of drops in the bucket. So we're, we're not filling the bucket, but I do think we have to be creative. We have to be innovative. And again, if it's the last thing I say, it would be about collaboration. Except Craig, I'm going to be a bit cheeky and I'm going to add two more things, which is we, we, we all know they're important, but we haven't talked about them enough, which are gender and climate change, which are at the, the, the two pillars of, as far as we're concerned from a blue economy perspective, Again, if we're dealing with half of the population, we're ignoring half the solutions. So gender is, is essential to the development of the blue economy. And then climate change, sadly, is just a reality that we have to deal with. So as a conclusion, bringing climate change and finance, I would say, let's talk about blue carbon. That is an area in which we are looking. It's a source of funding, but it's also a way of addressing a series of complex problems. Sorry, I went over, but it was important. That's great. No, I, I saved the toughest question for you, Charlotte. I knew you'd thank love it. You. <laughs> and great, great, great response. And thank you for bringing in the pillars of gender and climate change, uh, fundamental to the, to the solutions that we all seek. Uh, before we go to the Q&A, Satyendra, I'd love you to take us out here. Give us a vision. Uh, we've talked about some ocean plans. We talked about the Ocean Action 2030. You know, Fiji's been really a visionary on this approach and, and inside the ocean panel, a big advocate for this. You know, give us a 2030, give us a vision. What does this all bring? What are the benefits to Fiji? What does Fiji look like in 2030 because you've embarked and fulfilled this headline commitment? Uh, 2030 may be a stretch, but 2050 should look something, uh, something like this. We have 100% uh, highly protected area that's uh, uh, given. Fiji is a tourist economy and there are many tourist, uh, tourist economies that uh, uh, when you are traveling to Fiji and uh, to a high, uh, to hundred percent sustainable blue uh, economy, you are feeling good about it. Your carbon is, uh, is uh, uh, credited uh, uh, through mangroves and coral reef rest uh, restoration, et cetera. And you're contributing to real skills. For young people, the stake is that uh, there is a different way in which uh, they are looking at skills and expertise that are necessary from the oceanography, uh, marine uh, special planning to indigenous knowledge and bringing that in, into conservation and uh, sustainable blue economies in a more sustainable way. So there's that whole side of it. And Charlotte, thanks for mentioning financing. There's a whole body of uh, uh, skill sets to be developed uh, for carbon trading and new skills, uh, exciting skills for young people, for uh, uh, financial markets, new ways of thinking about products such as blue bonds, which you have ex uh, explored, new ways in which uh, UNCDF, UNDP and others can help countries like ours explore innovative private uh, financing and bringing a whole variety of uh, financing tools to sustainable development and uh, sustainable blue uh, blue development. And uh, finally, and, and the last two points, let me conclude uh, on, on Charlotte's point, is that uh, uh, we have uh, transformed uh, the fight on climate change by looking at uh, oceans in an integrated way across the whole of the world, not only through Fiji and, uh, and Mexico and other, other uh, uh, leaders, uh, that uh, we know that the oceans are in good health and uh, that they, they shall remain so for the foreseeable future. And we know that women are fundamental central part of it and driving uh, both the sustainability of it and the conservation of it in, in ways uh, uh, that, that just stretch our Im imagination. So it's infinite, it's limitless. And I, I suspect that the future of a good part of the planet and humanity and our collective well-being across the world, including for landlocked countries, uh, will depend on how well we get this right, how we get this right. Thank you very much for getting me on the, on the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Satyendra. And thank you. Virtual round of applause to all of our panelists here. It was wonderful insights, personal experiences, aspirations, challenges, and offers uh, to the world here. So really, really appreciate that. We're going to turn now to a bit of Q&A. We have about a little less than 10 minutes to field some questions. 
uh, that, uh, that from our audience. I'm sorry, audience, you won't get through all the questions, but we'll find a way to actually get back to you uh, with some responses. Uh, one question that's popped up a lot is this question about how to get everyone aligned. Part of the challenges we foresee and some are experiencing is how do you get, you know, public sector vision, various private sector visions, how do you get people, how do you get all these stakeholders aligned to kind of a common shared vision that kind of underpins the Sable Ocean Plan? So love to hear from anyone on the panel. Not everyone has to answer the question, but love to get quick thoughts, brief thoughts on how to get alignment. Anyone want to take that question? Martha, it sounds like you've been in that process maybe. Well, is is one of our challenges, uh, doesn't it? Uh, the alignment uh, is done when everybody agreed on doing specific things together. And uh, I have to say that it just not include uh, the government. You have also to take into account the private sector, take into account the uh, different stakeholders that uh, are engaged and involved in the ocean management. And of course, all the local governments, uh, state uh, authorities and federal governments that are regulating this activity around. So uh, I think that uh, the, uh, the need of uh, the sustainability of the management of oceans in the future is the, the key message for all to get an agreement on how to really get the advantage of these richness and resources and not to deploy them and in the future the, getting nothing. In Mexico, we have experienced that before. We have, uh, for example, with shrimp, we overfished shrimp in the coast of the Sea of Cortes. I, I uh, was born in that area and I have to say in a personal story, my, my father was broken because of the overfishing of, of the shrimp in, in that sea. So it is a, for mutual and for everybody advantage to get a plan together. And that is, I think that the main uh, driver of the uh, consensus that we have to gather amongst everybody. Great, thank you. Thank you, Martha. We, we had a question here about uh, how can the high level panel and others, you know, members of Ocean Action 2030, how can we encourage and or incentivize countries to develop same ocean plans? I mean, the ocean panel itself, those 15 countries that have committed to doing so, but how do you, what's the best way of encouraging others to do the same, to follow in that path? Julian. Well, I think one, one very clear aspect is to show the benefits of, uh, of implementing sustainable ocean planning. Um, and that require, you know, being able to tell a story uh, and, and a story hopefully of success uh, where you know you are demonstrating that by putting those those measures in place, you are reducing conflicts, you are creating a, a an environment for for companies to invest in a in a secure and and you know kind of well understood environment where you know you you can predict what the future is going to look like at least in terms of regulation. Um, so I think it's uh, it's really about being able to 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 share those experiences and to learn from each other. Uh, to, to really be able to, 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 to explain those. And that will, of course, require having specific channels uh, of engagement with different uh, you know, group of stakeholders, whether private sector or, or public. Great, thank you, Julian. Uh, Satyendra, there's a question here from, uh, from some of the audience about engaging indigenous peoples when it comes to sustainable ocean planning. And I think there was a there's an interest in understanding how is Fiji pursuing that to ensure that they're fully engaged, fully understand, and fully have voice uh, in these processes. Uh, thanks, Craig. Uh, very important question and uh, uh, difficult uh, to, to respond. Uh, there's no one indigenous community. There are many, many uh, diverse uh, uh, communities with uh, different experiences and different en engagements uh, with the ocean. Some of them may be highly coastal, some of them be riverine, some of them may be uh, small islands, etc. In, uh, in our own experience, the development of the National Oceans Policy, this has been a three-year process in which uh, uh, the stakeholders have uh, gone out and consulted from ground up and built the picture of, uh, of uh, our ocean in, in a way which they did not have and the stakes that different indigenous communities have and how they think and uh, perceive uh, 
uh, their role, their economic, their social, their cultural identity, and uh, every aspect of ocean life. These have been brought in through many, many consultations. I, I, I don't think we have got it 100% right, and there must be a lot of space to improve that, uh, but we have a foundation to build on. So that's one part. Second part is that uh, uh, then when, uh, in terms of actions and uh, 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 activities uh, that drop out of uh, policies and programs, different uh, communities will uh, will uh, be dealing with different types of uh, uh, programs. Some of them may be uh, having a larger responsibility for protection uh, in their traditional uh, fisheries areas, for example. Others uh, may be uh, thinking about more value-added uh, uh, small-scale production uh, uh, that, uh, so that uh, we can uh, uh, move away from this uh, approach of fisheries where we essentially fisheries is mining uh, in the same way you mine coal uh, to something that is uh, creating variety of value addition using indigenous technologies, indigenous knowledge and indigenous, in, indigenous understanding of, uh, of marine protection. So a whole variety of ways and uh, this is a work in progress. Uh, we are learning a lot uh, as, a, as a system, as, as, a, as a government, as a, as a, as a nation and uh, and, and the fact uh, that uh, these are three uh, consultations that are still uh, well well underway, uh, watch this space and, and I, I think uh, there'll be a, a very exciting outcomes coming out of this, but it's fundamental to all parts of the 100% approach, so fundamental that uh, it, you should begin and uh, indigenous communities should be at the uh, center stage, not the margins, they should be driving the understanding and how we proceed rather than recipients of, uh, of uh, understanding and knowledge and, and how, how they uh, apply to them. Great, thank you, Sachendra. We're gonna be wrapping up the Q&A session here, but Charlotte, just wanted to give you closing remark. Any final thoughts in 30 seconds you, as we whisk away from Q&A to close out? I love, I'm sure you have some perspectives. I feel picked on and I love it. Thank you, Craig. Um, I had raised my hand, actually, the very important question, which was how do we bring people to the table? How can we make the point for sustainable ocean plans and for the blue economy? I think the most important thing is, is to address the fact that this is a false dichotomy. It's not about development, economic development versus conservation. It's not about, it's about healthy oceans. Because healthy oceans provide the services that we need for development, but development can hurt healthy oceans. So how do we strike that balance? So I'm just going to give an example for for Pro Blue, we have a, a short log, um, uh, anthem, if you will, which is healthy oceans, healthy economies, healthy communities. And I think if we can strike that balance, let's understand that we cannot be dogmatic. Let's understand that we have to work together. I'm reiterating the fact that the bank is, is happy to be counted as one of the, member, uh, the members of the coalition. And we look forward to working with countries like Mexico and Fiji and, and others. I will say we have limited resources. So it's not exactly um, uh, an, an ocean of resources, but we're really looking forward to, to working with others to implement this and show that it can work. Thank you very much. What a fantastic roundup here. Virtual round of applause to all our four panelists. Thank you very much for all you've done and all you're going to do going forward. And now I turn things back over to Christian Talaki. Christian, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Craig. Thank you so much, panelists. Fantastic stuff, inspirational as we move forward. And perhaps just a, a final few reflections and thoughts on, on what we've heard today. Clearly, the ocean plays a unique role in regulating our climate and supporting biodiversity. There is no doubt about that. Um, and really, there is no race to net zero and resilience or any of our shared global goals and challenges that does not involve protecting the ocean. And we've heard that referenced many times. The ocean benefits us all, providing us with food and supporting our livelihoods, whether we live by the ocean or not. The ocean holds values of paramount importance to our cultural heritage and indeed our identity. But as many of us know, the ocean is off track. And in order to maintain the services and opportunities that the ocean provides us to all of us, we need to manage our activities in the ocean in an integrated way. And a number of our panelists reference this, one that considers both environmental concerns and uses and users of the ocean. So now is the time to move faster towards a 100% approach to ocean management and governance. Today, we heard that by developing and implementing a sustainable ocean plan, countries will move away from business as usual towards achieving a sustainable ocean economy where effective protection, sustainable production, and equitable prosperity go hand in hand, the three Ps, remember them. 
The newly launched guide identifies the hallmarks of a sustainable ocean plan that can help countries set up plans for maximum success and indeed impact in the outcomes that we seek. And it suggests initial steps that the ocean and coastal states can take to get started on or accelerate uh, sustainable ocean planning, offering a common departure point relevant to all countries as they set out on their journey of 100%. The guide, as you know, is a product of significant expert input from across the globe and insights and insights from countries. And, and just to assure you, it was subject to a rigorous peer review process. So a really solid body of work for everyone to use and, and use as a basis for developing policies. policies. And the countries are not alone in this. The Ocean, Ocean Action 2030 Coalition, which we just heard about was and launched, was formed in response to the new action agenda launched by the Ocean Panel. As of today, as Cleric said, 16 leading institutions stand ready to provide technical and financial assistance that countries may need to develop and implement their sustainable ocean plans. Ladies and gentlemen, the world faces a moment of urgency. An aspired outcome of the Ocean Panel is that by 2030, sustainable ocean plans are providing a credible basis for safeguarding the long-term health and resilience of the ocean, attracting investment and creating jobs to the benefit of coastal communities and national economies. Ocean and coastal nations have no time to waste. As we head towards the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon, as Peter Thompson mentioned, next summer, we have to remind ourselves and our leaders that we have, well, we will have to leave behind traditional ways of doing business engage all stakeholders to move in the same direction and operate using sustainable and equitable ocean management. The Ocean Panel drives the 100% approach forward domestically, internationally, and developing and implementing sustainable ocean plans serve to stimulate and the realization of the 100%. Of course, as you heard before, details of where you can find and read the guide, and find out more about Ocean Action 2030 is on your screen now, and you can use a QR code to jump straight to the ocean uh, to the Sustainable Ocean Plan webpage on oceanplan.org. Um, others, of course, who are interested in engaging with the coalition or indeed want to find a little bit more welcome and should get in touch with the Secretariat. So with that, I thank you all so much. I thank our panelists. I thank all our speakers. Um, this has been a terrific session. Please use this guide. Be in touch. And again, I thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>